After the doctor told me I was dying, and after the man I married said he didn't love me anymore, I chased a miracle in California, and 16 weeks later, I got it. The cancer was gone. But when my brain caught up with it all, something broke. I later found out that all of the tragedy at once had caused a physical head trauma, and my brain was sending false signals of excruciating pain and panic. I spent three months propped up against the wall. On nights that I could not sleep, I laid in the tub like an insect staring at my reflection in the shower knob. I vomited until I was hollow. I rolled up under my robe on the tile. The bathroom floor became my place to hide where I could scream and be ugly, where I could sob and spit and eventually doze off, happy to be asleep, even with my head on the toilet. I have had cancer three times now, and I have barely passed 30. There are times when I wonder what I must have done to deserve such a story. I fear sometimes that when I die and meet with God that he will say I disappointed him or offended him or failed him. Maybe he'll say I just never learned the lesson or that I wasn't grateful enough. But one thing I know for sure is this. He can never say that he did not know me. I am God's downstairs neighbor banging on the ceiling with a broomstick. I show up at his door every day, sometimes with songs, sometimes with curses, sometimes apologies, gifts, questions, demands. Sometimes I use my key under the mat to let myself in. Other times I sulk outside until he opens the door to me himself. I have called him a cheat and a liar and I have meant it. I have told him I wanted to die and I meant it. Tears have become the only prayer I know. Prayers roll over my nostrils and drip down my forearms. They fall to the ground as I reach for him. These are the prayers I repeat night and day, sunrise and sunset. Call me bitter if you want to, that's fair. Count me among the angry, the cynical, the offended, the hardened. But count me also among the friends of God, for I have seen him in rare form. I have felt his exhale, laid in his shadow, squinted to read the message he wrote for me in the grout. I'm sad too. If an explanation would help, he would write me one, I know it. But maybe an explanation would only start an argument between us and I don't want to argue with God. I want to lay in a hammock with him and trace the veins in his arms. I remind myself, I'm praying to the God who let the Israelites stay lost for decades. They begged to arrive in the Promised Land, but instead he let them wander, answering prayers they didn't pray. For 40 years their shoes did not wear out. Fire lit their path each night. Each morning he sent them mercy bread from heaven. I look hard for the answers to the prayers that I didn't pray. I look for the mercy bread that he promised to bake fresh for me each morning. The Israelites called it manna, which means, what is it? That's the same question I'm asking again and again and again. There's mercy here somewhere, but what is it? What is it? What is it? I see mercy in the dusty sunlight that outlines the trees, in my mother's crooked hands, in the blanket my friends left for me, in the harmony of wind chimes. It's not the mercy that I ask for, but it is mercy nonetheless. And I learn a new prayer. Thank you. It's a prayer I don't mean yet, but I will repeat until I do. Call me cursed, call me lost, call me scorned, but that's not all. Call me chosen, blessed, sought after. Call me the one who God whispers his secrets to. I am the one whose belly is filled with loaves of mercy that were hidden for me. Even on days when I'm not so sick, sometimes I go lay on the mat in the afternoon light to listen for him. I know it sounds crazy and I can't really explain it, but God is in there, even now. I have heard it said that some people can't see God because they won't look low enough. And it's true, look lower. God is on the bathroom floor.